At the time of recording this, I just posted my thank you for 700 subscribers video a week ago. You guys already have me up to 850. I genuinely could not believe it. Editing me here. In the time it took to record this video, I already reached 925 subscribers. That is unbelievable. Thank you all so, so much. The next video is taking a little bit longer than I expected it to, so I decided to do a Q&A on my Twitter. This video is going to be a little bit more off the cuff than my normal scripted content where I'm just reacting and responding to the questions that people pose me. This video also won't be as heavily edited as my normal content, so apologies on that front. Without any further ado, let's get to the questions. First, LE asked me what got you into wrestling. For them, it was a friend who gave them SmackDown vs. Raw 2011 for their birthday. Amazing choice. I don't think WWE's topped that one ever since. But for me, it was two separate occasions that I think are equally as important. The first one was when my friend, when I was like six or seven, told me about the Randy Orton Triple H home invasion angle, and I thought that was absolutely nuts. Unfortunately, I didn't know where to start watching wrestling, so I just kinda didn't. The moment that really got me intrigued in wrestling, though, was when I watched a documentary when I was like 10 about the 50 greatest WWE wrestlers ever. I looked it up online afterwards and there were like 50 videos of people talking about how awful the list was and how Triple H should have been higher and John Cena should have been lower. Looking back on it, I entirely disagree with those opinions. I think John Cena should have been way higher and Triple H way lower, but that's what I love about wrestling. Julian Ortiz asks a similar question, but one I think is different enough to warrant its own inclusion on this Q&A. He asks, what is the match or moment that made you passionate about pro wrestling? and I can pretty confidently say that it was Stan Hansen versus Kenta Kobashi. Now, I've been a wrestling fan for quite a long time, but I never really got as passionately into it as I did after I watched that match. I credit Kobashi versus Joe for really rekindling my love for the art form, but this was my first experience with something I can truly call special. I watched it before I watched Kobashi Joe, because my dad went to see Stan Hansen vs. Bruno San Martino live in Madison Square Garden. He watched Bruno get his neck broken. Anytime we'd have a conversation about wrestling, he'd say, what do you know about Stan the Lariat Hansen? When I finally answered that question with, he's one of the best of all time, that's when I knew I loved this shit. Now, my dad's a huge Samoa Joe fan. Time really is a flat circle. Up next, YB asks, what aspect in wrestling do you feel is underrated or overrated? I can do both here. For something I think is overrated, this is going to be my coldest take of all time, but easily long-term storytelling. I know that's a big catch-all buzzword right now, but I'm specifically talking about drawn-out storylines that often halt other wrestlers' progress because it's quote-unquote not their time yet. For something I find underrated, that easily has to go to facial expressions. I know a lot of people have soured on them over the years because of what I like to call NXT face, which is when a wrestler is stunned somebody kicked out of a finisher, but I'm talking about something else entirely. Mean mugging. It's a big reason why guys like Kazunari Murakami, Samoa Joe, Loki, and Genichiro Tenryu have the aura that they do. They could just stare down a motherfucker like nobody else. I wish more people would do that today. The closest we have today is a guy like Gunther or Kazusada Higuchi. My friend Mason asks, who are your top three wrestlers that you thought could have been something? I think this can be interpreted in a bunch of different ways, so I'm going to give three different answers based on three different interpretations. First, someone kneecapped by the training they had, Vladimir Kozlov. If you put him in any other company in the world at that time, he would have been a beast. Imagine him in All Japan or fucking Noah. Late 2000s WWE is no pro wrestling Noah. The second guy is somebody who's always been so incredibly talented, but the company he worked for at the time didn't want to give him any opportunities to succeed, and that's Shoichi Funaki. WWF fans might know him as the less important half of Kai and Tai in the late 90s, but he should be remembered as one of the best junior heavyweights of his era. The fact that he was treated like a joke is more indicative of WWE's failure to ever get over a true Japanese wrestler more than it is on him. 
It is 2023 and they have one of the best wrestlers in the world, Akira Tozawa, doing a comedy ninja gimmick. Yet again, time is a flat circle. The third is a wild card, somebody who didn't ever become something big in pro wrestling because I'm not sure if they ever wanted to, and that's Kevin Randleman. Even though we only have a few matches of him in Hustle, what we saw was absolutely incredible. 250 plus pound Olympic level amateur wrestlers who can jump to the top rope with one leap don't exactly grow on trees. If he had retired from MMA a couple years earlier, actually wanted to be a pro wrestler, and didn't tragically pass away so young, Kevin Randleman could have done a reverse Brock Lesnar and revolutionized the pro wrestling and MMA game. My man Ash asks, Which Brian Peak is best, WWE, ROH, or AEW? There are so many answers here, all of which are completely correct, but I let my feelings decide for me on this one. I didn't know if I'd ever see a run as great as Samoa Joe's 2004 to 2005, but Brian managed a 2007 and 2008 arguably as brilliant. The Morishima matches, the best Nigel match in 2008, and his peak character work at that point in his career, I don't know if anything can top that from me. Jesse asks me, what do you prefer, 2000 CZW or IWA Mid-South? It's almost impossible for me to pick between these two. Mid to late 2000s, CZW was a special place. In the 2000s, the Cage of Death was a guaranteed hit every single year. But IWA takes the edge for one simple reason. No, it's not Necro Butcher vs. Samoa Joe. For years, the Ted Petty Invitational was the place for the best workers in the world to ply their craft against other great wrestlers you'd never seen them wrestle before. That tournament made guys like Chris Hero and Roderick Strong while solidifying top-tier indie workers as the best in their field if they showed up. Just for that, I gotta go IWA. Up next, Kevin Ford asks, What US indie promotion would you like to go back and follow in what you consider their prime in real time? For my tastes, I don't think anything could possibly top a Ring of Honor for this question. The rise of Samoa Joe, the CZW feud, Brian's ascent to best indie worker in the world, Roddy turning into a beast, Age of the Fall, and the briscoes Stinerico rivalry. That's just off the top of my head, there's way too much for me to pass up on. Between going to every show and buying every single DVD, I'd be flat broke, but very, very happy. Fellow video creator Andos asks, What do you feel is a lost art from wrestling's past that today's wrestlers could benefit from? I could give you like 5 billion different answers to this, but I think the most comprehensive is one of the arguments from my hauntology video. I think wrestlers should accept that they can't do everything and focus on what they do really well. The all-around solid mold rarely, if ever, does anything to me. They don't have those weaknesses for their opponents to exploit, and I don't know, tell a compelling story about overcoming limitations or getting away around them? Basic wrestling stuff, you know? My friend Henry asks two questions. The first, tips to pushing or staying motivated through when doing videos. For the way my brain works, I like to write down how much of the video I have edited, subtract the total length, and track my progress that way. The writing process is harder to keep up with sometimes, but re-watching a match will usually get me in the right headspace to talk about what I like and what I find flaws in. And for his second question, what is your cartoon character and pro wrestler dream team or match, I'll do you one better and give a full four-team tag team tournament bracket. First round is Hank Hill and Stan Hansen versus Abe Simpson and Yoshiaki Fujiwara. The second match... Squidward and Jimmy Jacobs versus Clifford the Big Red Dog and Kevin Steen. Obviously, the finals are going to be the Texas twosome of Hill and Hansen versus Clifford and Steen. And it's going to be a wild bloodbath where Clifford almost wins, but Hansen lariats him out of the arena. Arlen forever, baby. The next two questions are different, but they're similar enough that I want to answer them at the same time. Speckles asks, Inoki or Baba? And John Taffer, UFO Death Cult, asks, Do you prefer King's Road or Strong Style? Who? what a question. If we're talking in-ring for the first question, I don't think there are many wrestlers in history who can compare to the excellence Antonio Inoki displayed night in and night out. Giant Baba is truly great in the ring. If you haven't gone back to watch some of his Terry Funk tag team matches, I highly recommend doing so, but... 
Man, it's Anoki. The second question depends entirely on your definition of strong style. Two or three years ago, I would have said King's Road in a heartbeat, but now it's a much more difficult question for me. If by strong style you mean modern Bushiroad era New Japan, I'd definitely take King's Road. If you're talking about the classic Anokiist hybrid shoot style stuff popular in the late 90s and early 2000s New Japan though, my answer completely changes. I know this probably sounds blasphemous given the name I chose for myself, but I don't know if there's any style that really gets to what I love besides the battle art style better than this one. I know that's a very unpopular opinion in the wider wrestling landscape, especially the 2000s part, because so many consider those New Japan's quote-unquote dark years. Plus the fact that it's a Sisyphean task trying to talk about any New Japan on YouTube without getting your channel thrown into a black hole. But some of my favorite matches of all time happened in that short window. I still love King's Road, don't get me wrong whatsoever. But that period of New Japan history is really something special. If you take nothing from this video, go out of your way to watch Yuji Nagata and Kensuke Sasaki bloody each other around the Tokyo Dome from January 2004 as soon as possible. One of the best first watches I've had all year. Absolutely fantastic username El Hijo del Crackhead asks me one of the hardest questions I have here. Favorite MJF match? Oh boy. I'd probably have to say the dog collar match. It's arguably the weakest and best we've seen of him yet. Fired up, desperate, and slightly cowardly MJF is my favorite version of the man. I really hope he keeps getting worked up like that. My man Prince of Strong Style asks me a question I could make 10 50 minute videos about. What would you say are the best interpromotional matches and feuds you've seen, and what makes the idea of these so great? The best interpromotional feud, in my opinion, isn't a very difficult question because it fulfills everything I want out of something like it, and that's War vs. New Japan. Genichiro Tenryu, my favorite wrestler of all time, and his band of misfit outsiders trying to topple Anoki's ivory tower is my favorite version of interpromotional warfare. It's probably why I like ROH vs. CZW so much, too. For similar reasons, the NJPW vs. UWF feud at the 1980s is also one of my favorites. For individual matches, the best I've seen are Tenryu vs. Shinya Hashimoto from War in 1993, the New Japan vs. UWF Elimination Tag Team match, and of course, the pinnacle, the Ring of Honor vs. CZW Cage of Death. I think the appeal of these kind of rivalries boil down to the reason I love professional wrestling so much. It's two dueling ideologies trying to prove to the fans that their version of pro wrestling is the best. Most of the time they include stiff and slightly uncooperative shots, and that doesn't hurt in the slightest. I just love that base level of two differing beliefs on what great pro wrestling is at its core, and how those philosophies work together to create something special you won't see anywhere else. Sharknado says to stay hydrated, which trust me, I'm doing very well right now, asks My biggest what-if match in Puro history? It's physically impossible for me to pick just one. There are so many that could've and should've happened at some point or another. Tenryu vs. Akira Tawe in a singles match, Yoshihiro Takeyama vs. Masaki Mochizuki, the Briscoes vs. Wild 2 of Takeshi Morishima and Takeshi Rikio. Finally, the singles between two of New Japan Pro Wrestling's best junior heavyweight wrestlers ever, in Shinjiro Otani and Tatsumi Fujinami. That's gotta be my Mount Rushmore. My hidden gem that we have 40 seconds of, though, is Takeshi Ono vs. Thonam Saktoba. That is my all-time pro wrestling dream match, and I would do anything to get my hands on the full thing. My friend Catch asks, given that there were so many shooters and shoot style guys in the Big Two's rosters during the late 90s with guys like Flynn, Perry Saturn, and Glacier in WCW, Shamrock, Severn, Vader, and Steve Blackman for the WWF, why do you think an attempt at shoot style was never made? These last few questions are three for three in things that I would make entire videos about, but long story short, I think the US was just too far behind Japan to make something like that work in the same time frame. Feasibly, shoot-style companies like UWF, Rings, and Pancrase worked the best when MMA was in its infancy. I love shoot-style and think it should exist in every form imaginable today, but that period from the mid-80s to the late-90s was a window where it really became a phenomenon. 
by the time the major companies got those wrestlers on their roster, the UFC was already decently established. The far simpler and probably more correct answer is the Brawl for All. Even if it existed beforehand, that debacle ruined any chances of American shoot-style promotions turning into a real thing. Do I think they'd be successful? Not particularly. Exactly for my taste in pro wrestling, you bet your bottom dollar. Even if it wouldn't have made a lot of money, it would have been the sickest promotion in wrestling history, bar none. Catch asks another question, do you fantasy book? If yes, what have been some ideas you've been the fondest of? Now I know for a fact that Catch knows the first half of this question, but he just wants you guys to know the cookage I've been coming up with lately. I love fantasy booking, especially when you draft a roster of wrestlers from a different time period than today. One of my favorites is one from 2007 where I filled the roster with small guys who love to bump and Bob Sapp. My favorite piece of fantasy booking so far though has got to be when I made a two hour show that included under 30 seconds of wrestling on it. Picture completely unrelated, by the way. Up next, Bizarro asks, will we see more serialized content in the future, potentially covering matches, shows, and etc.? I'm not sure about true serialization a la Joseph's Walking the King's Road series just yet, but I do have something in the works that's going to take a long, long time to accomplish. I do plan on posting more multiple part videos though. Hopefully one of those is coming soon. Friend of the channel Illegitimate Murderer asks, what are your thoughts on Kiyoshi Tamura and Gleet if you're more familiar with them? I can't say that I've watched much Gleet outside of their Ledet UWF division, but the things I've seen from there are absolutely phenomenal. I wish they'd run more shows under that name. I'm hoping to post a video about Kiyoshi Tamura and why I think he's one of the best shoot style wrestlers of all time soon. He's my second favorite rings guy besides Vulcan. If you haven't checked his matches against Tsuyoshi Kosaka and Yoshihisa Yamamoto out, you're missing out. A fluid mat grappler and a phenomenal striker, there are very few who combine those two aspects of shoot style as well as Tamura does. Reese asks for a truly gargantuan task. Say something nice about modern day WWE and or AEW and say something negative about Prime ROH and PWG. Modern WWE has some of the best wrestlers on the planet under their roof, so once in a blue moon they'll pull out something great like Gunther vs. Gable. AEW gave my favorite indie wrestler of all time a home and a way to beat his biggest rival once again. I can never take that away from them. As much as I love Prime Ring of Honor, no company can bat a thousand. There are definitely some main events there that go a little bit too long and not exactly for my tastes. Besides problems with early PWG, especially the commentary and some of the wrestlers, it's a primary reason we have so much of what I like to call high spot soup in wrestling today. Stuff I really, really do not like. Evil Yoshihashi Spooky Salad asks, what one wrestler from the past and one wrestler from right now would you love to work together in any capacity? Tag teams, singles feud, what have you. Oh man, there are so many. This one isn't necessarily right now, but I would do anything to see Prime Stan Hansen vs. Hall of Pain Mark Henry in a Texas vs. Texas match. Tag team would probably be the grumpy middle-aged duo of Masanobu Fuchi and modern Samoa Joe. This may just be me, but I would do anything to see a Prime Terry Funk vs. Matt Tremont bloodbath as well. Young Rey Mysterio against PWG Akira Tozawa would be a cruiserweight fever dream. I have to stop myself before I continue listing pairings for 20 minutes. Goldtooth Luther asks, what are the best and worst matches you've experienced live? The best? If I let recency bias and catharsis win out, it's definitely Eddie vs. Claudio. Seeing my man win his title in his hometown is like nothing I've ever experienced live in pro wrestling. Some runners-up would be Jay White vs. Will Ospreay from Ring of Honor in 2017, and Mike Bailey vs. Sammy Callahan in CZW. The worst is a lot harder for me, a lot of the forgettable ones I, well, forgot, and there aren't a lot of bad ones that stand out to me as particularly awful. The most underwhelming by far though was Adam Cole vs. Kyle O'Reilly for the Ring of Honor World Championship. I was a huge Kyle O'Reilly guy back then, but it didn't feel nearly as big or bombastic as I expected it. To this day, I think it's one of the worst no-DQ matches the company has ever put on. 
Up next, Travis Gordon asks, which year or period did you have the most fun watching wrestling? If you're talking about what time frame in wrestling history I liked the most, I have a few potential answers for this one. Late 90s battle arts, obviously, early 2000s New Japan, the obvious Kings Road and AJW, so probably a range from 1995 to 2005. Oh, and if you couldn't tell already, add Ring of Honor into that. Dory Fauna Jr. asks, Do you think Fujiwara actually went into the strip club he was videoed walking around in that Carl Gotch documentary Fumi Saito directed? You know, I think some mysteries are better left unsolved. He definitely did, and you can never tell me he didn't. Even if he didn't, please don't tell me he didn't. Ahmed Abdel Magid, I sincerely apologize if I mispronounce that, asks my top 5 Terry Funk matches. This could be its own entire series of videos. Just a slight clarification, this is nowhere near my final, complete answer to this question because I need to watch way more of his unbelievable catalog before I can answer fully. Even if I've watched a lot of the matches I deem some of his best, there is still so much more I need to go into. The one slightly underrated classic I'll mention here is the Bockwinkle match from the 80s. Nick Bockwinkle is one of those wrestlers that if you know and you've seen enough of him, you absolutely fall in love with what he does. But I don't think nearly enough people know who he is and his contributions to the industry. I'd argue he's still the most charismatic wrestler of all time besides maybe Eddie Kingston, and his matches are fucking sublime. This is one of my favorites of his career. The second match I have to mention, no matter how I feel about the other guy, is the Lawler match in Memphis, the first one. It was truly something special. If a wrestling match fully holds up a year or two after it happened, it's something you need to remember. If it holds up 40 years later, it's a testament to why so many people love pro wrestling throughout the generations. Terry and Dory Funk Jr. vs. The Butcher and The Sheik is another all-time great tag team bout. Matches like these are the spaghetti western equivalent of southern tag brawls, where Giant Baba knew how to get as much excitement out of a pairing as humanly possible, maybe even more than the southern bookers themselves. The Stan Hansen match from 1983 is practically here by default. It's two of the best of all time giving all they've got in under 15 minutes. No notes. The only thing in my mind that can top that match right now for me is his inimitable first retirement, with Dory at his side taking on Stan Hansen and Terry Gordy. If you don't immediately associate the word forever with Terry Funk, you need to watch this match again. Craig asks two questions. What has been your favorite part about creating content so far? Definitely all the friends I've made and the people with similar interests in wrestling to my own. I love that people enjoy hearing what I have to say about wrestling because I have quite a bit to say about it. It's an incredibly affirming and rewarding experience when I put a lot of effort into something and people really enjoy it. The next question is, what's a modern day dream match that, if it happened today, it would likely be a greatest match ever contender? Hmm. I'm not sure how many of those there are left, but I'm interpreting modern day as matches that include wrestlers who are still active as of recording. With those qualifications, my answers are as follows. Walter slash Gunther vs. Roosh, Old Man Joe vs. Jun Akiyama, and a personal dream match at this point in their careers. One that's especially possible given DDT and Big Japan's propensity to work together, Kazusada Higuchi and Takuya Nomura in a singles match. My man Armani asks, rank the indie big four, CZW, Chikara, Ring of Honor, and IWA Mid-South. Based on some of the other answers I've already given, you can probably guess this, but it would go Ring of Honor first, IWA Mid-South second, CZW third, and Chikara fourth if we're going prime for prime. The last two questions are about my personal favorites, so you might hear some of these matches come up in future videos. The first is from Grappleholics, who asks, Favorite wrestling match from each decade, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and 2020s? For the 70s, as I haven't seen too much, it has to be Jumbo vs. Nick Bockwinkle or Jumbo vs. Terry Funk. For the 80s, it's Funk vs. Jerry Lawler, Tenryu vs. Jumbo Saruta, or Stan Hansen vs. Andre the Giant. The 90s is where it gets really interesting. My short list includes the Battle Arts October 30th tag team match, Tenryu vs. Hashimoto, 6995, 12-696, Casas vs. El Hijo del Santo vs. El Dandi, 
The Mask vs. Hera placed us between Casas and Hijo del Santo, Aja Kong vs. Bol Nakano, and Aja Kong vs. Yumiko Hotep. For the 2000s, number one with a bullet is Samoa Joe vs. Necro Butcher. Then we have Blackout vs. Team Cash, Ikeda vs. Ishikawa from Futen, Joe vs. Kobashi, Sasaki vs. Nagata, Danielson vs. Morishima, Fight Without Honor from Final Battle 2008, Aja Kong vs. Kaoru, The Ring of Honor vs. CZW Cage of Death, and a little match called Crazy Crusher vs. Hellstorm. For the 2010s, it's a three-way tie between Black Terry vs. Wotan, John Cena vs. Brock Lesnar, and Katsuyori Shibata vs. Kazuchika Okada. For the 2020s, it's again Ikeda vs. Ishikawa, this time in WXW, the Brian Danielson Hangman Page rematch, Sami Zayn vs. Johnny Knoxville, and come on, you know the real answer to this. Video on that coming out soon. Finally, the first question I got... Hitori Goto asks, what's your top one match and top one wrestler? Top one match is a floating list between 6995, 12696, Shibata Okada, Tenryu vs. Hashimoto, Necro Butcher vs. Samoa Joe, Black Terry vs. Wotan, and a bunch I didn't just mention, including the FMW Texas Death Tag Team match, LCO vs. Akino and Ayako Hamada, Sammy Callahan vs. Danny Havoc, and Brian Danielson vs. Takeshi Morishima, the first one. As far as top one wrestler goes, it's a tie between Genichiro Tenryu and Yuki Ishikawa, two men with their own passionate visions about what pro wrestling can be at its finest. And that concludes our Q&A for today. Thank you so much for helping this channel reach 900 subscribers. For a channel like mine, that is an absolutely huge milestone, and I wanted to say I'm so appreciative of everybody who enjoys hearing me talk about pro wrestling. It's clearly something I'm incredibly passionate about, and I hope I can show you that passion in the near future. I have a couple videos in the works right now, including one about the KT Don main event that blew me away so heavily. So stay tuned to this channel for more content coming soon.